as you heard, we're talking today about Mary. Um, Mary gets visited by the angel Gabriel, who has, uh, to put it uh, mildly, some surprise news for her. Uh, but in order to kind of get a sense of what's going on maybe in Mary's head, we have to go back a little bit, <clears throat> starting about 400 years before that. Uh, the people of God uh, in Judah were exiled, uh, exiled to Babylon. Re a lot of them removed from their homes. The city of Jerusalem uh, laid waste. And the reason is that they had continually violated the covenant of God. Uh, and when I say they violated the covenant of God, it isn't that they just could not stop eating bacon or something like that. Uh, but rather, they continually got caught up in worshiping other gods, the gods of the Canaanites. Uh, and when I say worshiping other gods, I don't mean they got another religious perspective. Uh, worshiping in the Canaanite gods meant uh, forced ritualistic prostitution and child sacrifice, which is all described actually in the Old Testament. Uh, so God, uh, after a period of time of being incredibly gracious, decided that it was time for them to remove, uh, be removed from the promised land. But in uh, about 400 years before Jesus, they returned. Uh, and <clears throat> when they returned, there was still a sense of exile. Uh, because they were still under the thumb of a foreign pagan ruler. First the Persians, then the Greeks, and then the Romans. And especially under the Greeks and Romans, things got incredibly violent. Uh, but also because when they rebuilt the temple where God was to dwell... Uh, it wasn't the same. They didn't have like that uh, invading power of God. Uh, God's presence wasn't obvious and manifest like it had been in the days of King Solomon. Things just weren't right. And so in a sense, they were still in exile. And as they were still in exile, uh, they started taking to heart and, and, and mulling over uh, what their ancient prophets had been saying. See, the prophets had warned that if the people persisted, uh, they would be exiled. But they always coupled that with a message of hope, that someday they will return. And even though they had returned, they, had, they were still waiting for God to finish doing what he promised he would do. And so they, they came to realize that at some point in history, God is going to send somebody who had a special task. He was anointed for something. Or in Hebrew, he was a Mashiach, uh, or the Messiah. And in Greek, that's Christ, or Christos. Now, <clears throat> this means that they were waiting for a king. Messiahs uh, were often kings. And this king would come, and he would free the people from their foreign oppressors that he would reestablish the nation of Israel like in the days of kings David and Solomon, that the temple would be reformed and it wouldn't be corrupt like it had become, that God's presence would re-invade re, uh, this sacred space, that everything would be made right. They would be a light to all the nations, and they would live in peace. Now, if that is the story that they're telling, which it was, uh, you can imagine, then, that there would be times when a strong leader would arise amongst the people, which would often erupt into violence, and people would wonder and hope that maybe this is the Messiah. Is he the one we are waiting for? Now, after Jesus was born, I, I imagine that... that uh, maybe Joseph, his earthly father, is kind of sitting around the campfire or whatever they have. And maybe Jesus and his little buddies, when they're little kids, uh, he would tell them maybe stories. And we know that they told these stories to uh, little Jewish kids as they were growing up. Stories of he uh, heroism. Like in the days of the Hasmonean family, who became known as the Maccabees, which means the hammer. How the, this evil king, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, actually uh, erected a statue of Zeus in the temple in Jerusalem and tried to force people to uh, do sacrifices to Zeus and how 
uh, one of the, the people actually rushed the guards who were trying to force this and killed him. And it erupted into riots, and it kicked off years and years of guerrilla warfare against the Greeks. Now that's, mind you, guerrilla, G-U-E, not guerrilla, G-O-R, which would be so cool, like an army of guerrillas, but no. Uh, guerrilla warfare, which was effective, and how these freedom fighters won their independence from the Greeks for a period of time. And you would wonder, as these leaders would kind of arise and lead in these battles, that is he, Mashiach, is he the one we're waiting for? And nope, he's dead. Uh, okay, the one who took his place, like his son or his brother, is that him? Nope, he's dead. Is that him? Nope, he's dead. <clears throat> because everyone knew that a dead Messiah is a failed Messiah. Which is kind of weird when we get to Jesus. But anyway, uh, that eventually the house of uh, the Hasmoneans fell. But they still told those stories because it was a glimmer of hope. Uh, just like uh, my dad used to tell me and my brothers the stories of uh, the Alamo, these freedom fighters standing up to uh, an impossible invasion and how heroic they were and how cool that was. Or it is cool until you visit the Alamo, and it's like across the street from a shopping mall in San Antonio. And you're like, what happened? But anyway, these were the stories that they told. And, and the whole area of, of especially Galilee and Judea were hotbeds of this, this violent re, uh, revolution. Like, it, they were always a simmering pot waiting to boil over. Now, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but... When Jesus was somewhere between, between 10 and 12, a massive revolt broke out in the hometown of Galilee. And the Romans came in and killed thousands. And it's exceedingly likely that Jesus witnessed that. So these are the stories that they told because their hope was for a warrior king, a William Wallace type, to come and rescue them to end this exile, to end this embarrassing uh, overlord, pagan overlord, so that God's people will be ruled by one of their own. That is their hope. So when Gabriel appears to Mary, poof, and says, greetings, one who is favored, you will bear a son, what was she thinking? Well, first off, I, I mean, Luke doesn't tell us this, but I'm pretty sure she threw up. Because that's what I would do. Like, boom, angel, blah. And then I would call emergency psychiatric services super fast. But uh, this, this angel appears. And so first off, that's a rare thing. If, if you read the Bible, you, you might be tempted to think that God speaking through the clouds and intervening in these dramatic, miraculous ways was common, but it wasn't you kind of chart like a timeline of these events, you realize that there are, are spans of hundreds of years where nothing happens. And by the time uh, that uh, Jesus is born, uh, the rabbis had realized that God does not speak like that anymore. His coal, it, his voice has gone silent. And so they would talk instead about his bat coal, his um, daughter of a voice, like that just kind of whispers. So all of a sudden, boom. God appears. Now, I have uh, uh, several meditative moments, uh, just things that I want you to consider maybe after you leave here. The first is that, uh, have you experienced a, a period in your life where God has been silent? And so my question would be, how did that end? So, Gabriel appears, and he says to Mary, you are favored, you are going to bear a son, and he will be like his father David. How is she going to hear that? How would anybody have heard that as a good first century Jew? That the king is born, has been born like his father David. David was a warrior king. They said that King Saul slayed his thousands, but King David slayed his ten thousands. They think that the war is going to be coming. He's going to go to Jerusalem and kick the Romans out. He's going to reform the corrupt temple that God will be with his people. Israel will be their nation again. And yet, 
as we may know, that's not how that story plays out. So another meditative moment is, have you ever encountered a promise from God only to learn that's not what he had in mind at all? It's um, kind of an odd thought. That's the sort of thing that triggers a crisis of faith. And then Mary asks a, uh, a just a very practical question, a logistical question, like, how am I going to bear a child when I haven't, you know, like, just, I, what am I supposed to do with that? And Gabriel says, well, nothing's impossible with God. Like, the Holy Spirit will come upon her, and, oh, okay, well, I guess that makes sense. Now, Luke is a masterful storyteller. And we are meant to read this story, coupled with the story, uh, the previous story in chapter 1, on uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah is an old man. His wife is an old woman. Uh, They were unable to have children. Zechariah is also an old priest. He had been trained to do his priestly duties literally his entire life. He would have known the stories of Israel in and out. And he is standing there in the Holy of Holies. And God sends him a messenger. And uh, he says to Zechariah that his wife is going to have a child after all these years. And he'll be special. It'll be John the Baptist. And Zechariah says to him, how is that going to happen? I'm an old man. My wife's an old woman. He should have known better. A, an old, barren couple, or a couple that cannot conceive, is sort of God's specialty. He should have immediately thought, Abraham and Sarah, they were way old, and God gave them a son. That's how Samson was born, that she was barren, and God gave him to her. Uh, like, this is a thing that God does. And if he is an old priest, he should know that this is just another step in God's story. And yet he's like, how is that going to happen? What? To which point the angel's response is, okay, you're going to have a little time out. You're not going to be speaking until all of this comes to pass. I'd, I'd like to translate that as, because your response is ridiculous. You should know this. And of course, some might say that, well, Elizabeth finally got pregnant because he shut up for a while, but I just take that for what it is, pure speculation. But this old, learned guy should know and doesn't. This young, early teens girl has no reason to know or no reason to respond positively, and yet what does she say? I'm the Lord's servant. I, I will do what God asks me. Have you and this is another meditative moment, have you had the experience of somebody who should know better doesn't, and somebody who has no reason to know or get it does? We've probably been on either side of that, and especially the way that the old person responds will tell you something about them. They will either be humiliated or humble. And so she responds, uh, Mary responds, I will do what God has asked me to do. And yet she doesn't get just what God is asking her to do. That, yeah, she will bear the Son of God. He will be the King. But she doesn't know what that is going to mean. Now, when uh, Jesus is blessed by Simeon in the temple, when he's still a baby, he says in this kind of weird cryptic line as he gives his blessing— Uh, to Mary, and a sword will pierce your own heart. Because Mary is going to have to endure a ministry and career of Jesus where he is constantly attacked. He is saying something about the kingdom that the people didn't expect and frankly didn't want to hear. And she will watch as the life drains from his body as he is dying on the cross. What was set in motion right here is going to be a life of pain and struggle. And Mary didn't ask for any of that. Another meditative moment. Have you found yourself responding to what God wants for your life 
only sometime down the road you find yourself saying, God, I didn't ask for any of this. And this is pain beyond what I can bear. To which maybe we consider the example of Mary. But God is actually telling a different story here. Because while the people generally expected from Messiah King to be this conqueror, this William Wallace type of guy, this freedom fighter, when Jesus starts teaching about what the kingdom of God is, this rule and reign of God, it's not about uh, a a good Jewish ruler who has reformed the temple and established uh, Israel and fought off the bad guys, but rather the kingdom of God is something that exists within us. The kingdom of God is your neighbor doesn't have food, you have food, you give them their food. The kingdom of God is actually for the least of these, for those who have messed up, those who have been exiled from their communities, those who have harmed themselves and others, people like us. The kingdom of God is not about power or or coercion or wealth or comfort, but the kingdom of God is about love. It's about forgiveness. That the promise encapsulated in uh, this little baby who is forming in Mary's womb means something very different. God has made a promise, but that promise is not what the people think it is. It's so much more, and it's so much better. Now, I can talk about this in in vague or specific words, and maybe it will be helpful, but eventually you'll fall asleep. Because it just, sometimes it's hard to explain these things. So I'm going to actually use a piece of art, um, an image here that uh, should be on, and I just realized I forgot to tell the person working the projector this. Uh, This is called, um, it's called uh, The Virgin Mary Consoles Eve. It's a very striking painting. Now, First off, I just have to get, like, you know, cover my theological bases. Uh, There is a a disagreement between Catholics and Protestants. This is a Catholic work. That when uh, it is prophesied that, uh, you know, after Adam and Eve fall into sin, they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which means they choose wisdom apart from God. Uh, It says that, like, uh, you will crush uh, the serpent's head, but the serpent will bruise your heel. And the Catholics interpret that to be Mary— uh, we interpret that to be Jesus. And I think, you know, the, the text favors Jesus. Uh, in this case, it's Mary crushing the serpent's head because it's a Catholic work. Okay, I've said that. We can cover our bases. I won't get any emails about it. Now we can engage with the pain. Mary is drawing Eve in. There, the serpent is symbolizing uh, the, the evil one who has tempted tempted Adam and Eve to choose something apart from what God wants for them, kicking off a lifetime and uh, and, uh, the the sin that propagates throughout the human race. That serpent is still wrapped around her leg. Now, if we can go to the next uh, slide where uh, it's zoomed in a bit. Look at the shame on Eve's face. Look at the expectant hope. Kind of a muted joy on Mary. She is drawing her in and saying, feel the baby kick. Now, if you notice, uh, the, uh, if you remember, the, the serpent was still wrapped around the leg of Eve. And I, I showed this, and we kind of talked about it to a catechism class. Uh, for junior high kids uh, at my uh, previous congregation. And when I showed it to him, one of the kids asked, why is the serpent still wrapped around Eve's leg? And this one girl, exceedingly bright girl, said, is it because Eve is still grasping onto that fruit? She can't give her sin up yet. Wow. So the guy who should have known doesn't. 12-year-old girl incredibly insightful. But she's drawing her in as Eve is 
covered in shame. Because it turns out that the baby inside of Mary is not this nationalistic warrior hero. He is after our hearts. The problem isn't taxes and who's in power and and these pagan overlords, but actually the problem is within all of us. We are all in Eve. We have all taken part in this dehumanizing of ourselves and those around us. We have all sinned. Her shame is ours. And yet Mary draws her in as if to say, feel this baby kick. Because God has a promise. And that promise is so much more than we thought. And so much better. There's a a poem uh, that that is uh, associated with this. I'd like to read it. This is uh, Mary speaking. She says, My mother, my daughter, life-giving Eve, Do not be ashamed, do not grieve. The former things have passed away. Our God has brought us to a new day. See, I am with child, through whom all will be reconciled. O Eve, my sister, my friend, we will rejoice together forever. Life without end. That angel Gabriel announces that Mary is going to be pregnant. And this is God beginning to fulfill the promise he made. But in a way that nobody expected. Because this child is going to grow up and he's eventually going to go to his grave. Falsely accused, beaten, and executed in a public, torturous way. But it turns out that the shame on Eve's face that we just saw the shame in our hearts, that inner darkness that the Bible calls sin, also dies with the child that kicks in her womb. And that as the poem says, all will be reconciled. A new day is dawning when that grown-up child walks out of his grave. Because our sin the sin of Eve, the sin that courses through our veins, has died with him. And new life, a new day has dawned. Our hearts are resurrected. New life for the believers. As we approach Christmas, I pray that this promise continues to grow within our hearts. That we see ourselves in the the face of shame like Eve, but being drawn to feel that baby kick. Because that baby means that God is making good on his promise. It means a new day is coming. Through this child, all will be reconciled. Let's pray.